we're at Top Devil's Den. Here we are. Thanks for joining us. This is the American Battlefield Trust Facebook Live 155. Uh, in case you weren't watching before, I'm Gary Edelman. That's Chris White behind the camera. We've got Connor Townsend behind another camera over there. Uh, we, we, we don't take chances. We do it all again. We've got Dan Davis. We're back with uh, Doug Dowds. But first, let me bring up Timothy H. Smith, my Civil War pal, and he's going to talk about something special on this rock. Tim? Okay, so uh, this area that we're in right now is generally known as Devil's Den. And you probably know that uh, we're not sure exactly when it got its name or why it's called Devil's Den. It's a whole chapter in our book about the naming of Devil's Den, but it's a wild place filled with large rocks. And at the time of the Civil War, Devil's Den is by, owned by a local resident, John Halk. And he lives on Baltimore Street in the town of Gettysburg at the time of the battle. And I, it's one of the more interesting stories that we have. Uh, after our book was written, uh, this rock we're standing on right now had been covered with lichen. And there was a large tree next to the rock. And it, uh, I guess the tree blocked the sun. And um, if you come down here, after the tree was cut down about 10 years ago, and then what ended up happening was um, the lichen sort of disappeared. It revealed a rock carving. And clearly, it says John Houck, May the 18th, 1867. So the owner of Devil's Den carved his name on this rock a few years after the battle. Man, he owned it literally. Okay, we're already 15 minutes behind on this live. Doug Dowds, get on up yep. here, um, and let's talk about what we see in here. Let's get back to a little fighting. Okay, so this is a great vista for us to look at. We are sitting here in Devil's Den. We're looking off to the west, and you can see that far tree line. Remember, we're talking that this Anashalon attack, this a wave attack from south to north, is coming from that far tree line. If you want to think about a Domino's, Domino number one is the Vander Laws Alabama Brigade. They're going to be coming across this field just to our left. And right next to them is going to be Robertson's Texas Brigade. They're going to be coming straight at us across the field. And behind them are two Georgia Brigades under uh, Henry Benning and then George Anderson. As they come across this field, first things first, uh, right out, we can just make out a white barn just through those trees. That's where uh, John Bell Hood will be wounded. The division commander's out in the first 10 to 15 minutes. And now what you have is these Alabamans will come up and over Big Round Top. And as they do, they're going to be targeted by these artillery pieces behind us. They're going to kick off two regiments, the 44th and 48th Alabama, will swing down and hit Devil's Den from the south. And as these Texas Brigade comes across the field, they're going to recognize this divide, and there's this piece of land we see right out in front of us. And what it's going to do is divide that Texas Brigade. So the 3rd Arkansas and the 1st Texas will be off to our right, and now we see the 4th and 5th Texas drifting off to our left. It'll do the same thing to Benning's Georgia Brigade as they follow him behind. Half of his brigade will go to the north, half of it will go to the south. And as we look across the ground, we walked across this morning, you can see how rough it is with those trees and all those boulders and rocks out there. down into that valley and see all the boulders down in there. Imagine how much harder it is to go ahead and take units through that ground. And yet that's the ground that the Confederates would have to attack through in order to attack the southern face of Devil's Den and Little Round Top. Excellent. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I'm sorry we're not really interacting with you too much. We'll do our best to take your questions. Connectivity is an issue down amidst the large rocks of Devil's Den. Before we go down and, and get into the den itself, I want to point out one particular rock. It's a rock, Chris, if you could focus on that end, Connor. Um, it's the largest rock above the no parking sign over there because you're going to have a soldier, undoubtedly a Texan or a Georgian. He is uh, lying dead for the camera of Alexander Gardner. Um, he is laying right there next to that big rock. You can't quite see the big rock in the picture, but there are two rocks up above here. These two rocks are actually the two rocks right to our right. And we're gonna walk over to these two rocks now because you can see a stone wall between them. And that is where this soldier will be dragged to by the photographer about 72 yards as we go. So let's walk around this big rock here and we'll be there in a sec. You're watching uh, Civil War Trust, uh, Facebook Live 155, Gettysburg. I'm still learning to say American Battlefield Trust and Civil War Trust interchangeably. American Battlefield Trust is the umbrella organization for the Civil War Trust and the Revolutionary War Trust. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to check out battlefields.org. You can check out our membership options that we have over there. We have all kinds of great free content. Our uh, Steve Stanley Battlefield Maps. We have videos, in four videos, anything you can think of, all free for you. And we do hope that you'll click that membership button when you do check out battlefields.org. In a perfect world, we could put the cameras right here so we can line it up crouching next to it. Most Civil War photos were taken low to the ground because they're taken in 3D. And here is where the photo, um, the photographer moved the body to, to right this very spot here. I know it's not 
great with the sun, but you'll have to trust us. Um, there was a pool of water in this rock right where Tim's bag is sitting. Water doesn't really pool there anymore because some of the rock is broken. But here's where the, the uh, body was dragged to about 72 yards. William Frasinito and Frederick Ray discovered this uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and here you have it. He was laying right there and it became one of the most famous photos of the Civil War. Here's a colorized version of it, um, which is particularly really brings it to life and I think can humanize this soldier. Unlike the other soldiers photographed at Gettysburg, this soldier must have died later. He is not bloated. He has not succumbed to the um, horrible, um, uh, you know, visuals of putrefaction and, uh, and decomposition like the other, uh, you know, remains that you see here. This became a famous spot. Here it is taken after 1900. Photographers kept taking pictures here in 1867 and then in the 1880s and this one after 1900. And to this day, people like to come here and actually marvel that this is where a soldier breathed his last. But in this one case, one case, this soldier died elsewhere and the photographers moved the body. It doesn't mean they're moving bodies all over the place or anything. It moves they moved, it means they moved this body, and this is the only documented case of soldiers, of uh, photographers actually moving a body during the Civil War. Tim? Oh, well, you know, this is one of the most uh, famous photographs of the entire Civil War, and lots of people, uh, you can download this photograph in high resolution on the Library of Congress site. It's uh, fascinating to look at the details of the photograph, and there's been lots of articles written about this particular photograph. People claim that they, you know, the bodies were moved the other way. People have claimed uh, a few times that they knew who the body is. People have written that there are two different bodies and not the same body. A uh, bunch of stuff written about it. I don't think I believe any of the articles written about it. Um, it's pretty well, it just seems logical when you look at the photographs that this guy was laying down in here and moved to this location. Um, and our buddy William Frasinito has written uh, several um, chapters in his different books on the what we actually know about the move body. But I tell you, ever since I've been coming here as a young kid, uh, you get this, I don't know, I'm almost drawn to the spot where this soldier was positioned. And often as a kid, I would lay down like the soldier at the spot by myself and get my picture there taken too. And I've seen people um, you know, person after person after person do it with no coaxing. It's just you came up here, they see the photograph, and then they emulate the position of the body, sort of staging it just as the camera staged it in 1863. That's real and, cool. And, and I'll just say before Tim shows this picture that, you know, engage with your battlefield in the legal manner in which you can. Uh, there's no rule book on exactly how to interact on a battlefield. We've all seen people pass out, lash out, laugh, cry, every, every bit of human emotion, just like during the battle, except decidedly less terrifying, um, you know, can be seen when you visit a battlefield. So engage respectively, um, but but do what, what, what feels right to you as long as it's legal when you're on a battlefield. To me, I lay down on the spot the first time I ever came, and I've done it scores of times since then. That is not for some people um, to do. Remember, the soldier didn't actually die here. He was only dragged here. Tim? Well, um, you know, when I was young, I used to lay down like the soldier and get my picture taken to the same spot. And here is a photograph. I want to give a shout out to my son, Sam. And so Sam is positioned like the soldier at the time. It was all right because he was old enough to know he was two years old, I think, at that time. Um, I, I'd like to request that all the photos we show henceforth be in crinkly plastic, um, you know, and, and positioned in the sun. We're going to keep going down here. Thanks, Tim. Um, so we are what is called a top devil's den. Down there is a place called the slaughter pen. That's the big rocks over there. Try to advance three people in formation down there, let alone. Um, you know, regiments of two, three, four hundred coming through that position. Watch your step here as we go go down here. This is the large formation of rocks at Devil's Den, probably the largest on the battlefield, or at least among the largest on the battlefield, and certainly the most famous, the rocks of Devil's Den. As far as what Devil's Den actually is, um, People do not agree on that. People have been arguing about it since, um, you know, after the Civil War. We're going to talk about that a little bit as we get down there, but just check this out. I like to pause here sometimes just to show that this is, Devil's Den is the only place in the Gettysburg movie where they actually filmed stuff where it actually happened. Most of the movie was filmed off the battlefield, but the capture of Smith's battery was shot right up there, and right here, as Tim likes to say, you have some Confederates coming up here and coming up on these very rocks and shooting, and famously, one guy gets shot off the rock, and he will go fly off these rocks right here. They no doubt had some sort of a mattress or a pad for him to land on, a, on over there. So for you Gettysburg movie fans, this is shot right here. 
Yeah, undoubtedly it would be part of the 17th Georgia Infantry that crosses ground during the fighting. And this is what they came up against and this is what they had to cross in their line of battle. And that's really difficult for us to imagine today. One other thing, the rocks at Gettysburg are called diabase. And according to the Pennsylvania Geological Survey, they are 201.2 million years old. And we like to say 201.2 million and 13 years old, because 13 years ago, that's when we learned that number. Um, let's see, so here we are at the cross, the, uh, the, the big rocks of Devil's Den. I like to talk about the guy in the second Georgia that said that his friends were shot by the almost vertical fire from the blue-coated regulars coming down from the top. He identified this very spot on this road near the Devil's Den sign as where it happened here. Um, should we visit the original den real quick? Doug, did you have something to say? Yeah, so I think this is a really good place for us to stop, only because as you sit right in here, imagine all the chaos going around you. We talk about soldiers, most likely from the 99th Pennsylvania, shooting at the Confederates on this side of the, but if you turn and just look off to our right, at the same time, now all of a sudden you'd see little round tops all ablaze. The idea that you were sitting down in this valley with Union soldiers coming up the valley, Confederates coming through from the west, what a scene of carnage down here. Why, your attention may have been drawn up to the Union soldiers up above you, off to your right. There are Union soldiers firing down this way too. So wherever direction you turn, there is no place for safety. You can imagine why they use these rocks and these boulders as places where they might find some cover and concealment out in this battlefield. That's, that's really interesting. And by the way, we know the sun's over there. And despite you think we have some Herculean efforts to really fix things, we cannot move the position of the sun. Uh, we'll do the best we can. So don't post on there. Hey, it's washed out. We know we're doing the best we can. Come on over here now. Um, some people say they see the Devil's Den sign and assume all the rocks are sort of, that's Devil's Den. But Tim, the original guy who really popularized Devil's Den and whatnot, thought of something more specific. Uh, John Batchelder, uh, who was sort of the government historian of the Gettysburg National Military Park uh, and the commission when it started, he's the guy who actually wrote about it and sort of suggested that Devil's Den is not this large mass of rocks. It's a very specific spot a hole in the ground or a spring, uh, which is at the base of Devil's Den. Let's walk over and see it then. You wanna walk over and take a look at it? Okay. And, oh. Wow, Gary will really enjoy this when he gets here because uh, not often is there actually water coming out of the spring. Much it pretty much was, dried up long ago. Much as there but was in 1890s, as you can see right here. This area is what is referred to when they specifically, when somebody mentions the Devil's Den. And there are, look, this, what's interesting, there's caves that sort of run through there. And you can actually climb in and climb down and around and come out to, on the other side. Or go through another cave and come up and on top of the rocks. So obviously, kids love Devil's Den. I loved Devil's Den when I was a kid. I think Gary liked Devil's Den uh, when he was a little older than just a kid. In fact, it's 30 years ago this month was my first trip here. I did not know enough about Devil's Den to know that this was the original then or that there was even an argument about it, but I did check out the dead sharpshooter, walk around these rocks, and man, did I love it. There are six different ways in and out, and we're gonna, it's gonna be fun to see the cameraman crawl through there. Just kidding. Um, but let me be clear, this is not Devil's Den, real quick. That is Devil's Den. There's a cave back in there, and John Batchelder said it's a cave under rocks, it's very difficult to get into, and there's a spring that flows from it, and that's the original Devil's Den. Now, as we turn back out, I'm going to ask Tim to talk about it, because, man, there are big bears here, there are big raccoons here, there are big snakes here in the early stories of Devil's Den. Most are told by a guy named Emanuel Bushman. So, Tim, if you'll lead us out, let's talk about some of the animals associated with Devil's Den. So, uh, Devil's Den is pretty famous for, uh, you know, being a place with, which is a cave where animals live, but the most famous um, uh, creature that lives in Devil's Den is the black snake. And according to Emanuel Bushman, writing about it in 1875, there was one large snake. And according to the account, he was big around in a man's waist, he was 15 or 20 feet long, and he was the devil. And this was his den. So people in Gettysburg always referred to it as Devil's Den. 
And according to Bushman, uh, his grandmother said that the Native Americans before the European settlers used to talk about the snakes down here and the one big snake. And he said his name was Heap Big Snake. <laughs> That's great. There's also supposedly, they called it Raccoon Den as well. And there was a man named DeGroft and two nasty large raccoon charges on him for trespassing. The story is he was almost killed. There's another story about a uh, Native American, an Indian guy that, you know, came upon a bear and he reached down his throat and ripped out his heart and the bear died. And there's all sorts of great stories about this. There is Native American fighting documented within a mile of this position. The Battle of the Crows, supposedly. Maybe a hundred uh, Indians or Native Americans engaged at the time. So, man, you can go back and forth with the stories of myth and legend. And today is July 2nd, 2018. It's Gettysburg 155. Tonight, um, Tim, Chris, and I will all be at the Gettysburg Heritage Center. Uh, Tim's doing John Burns. Chris is doing the Wheat Field. And I'm talking about Devil's Den. If you want to learn more about Devil's Den, too, download the Civil War Trust Gettysburg. I'm sorry, yeah. Barrett, it'll soon be called American Battlefield Trust Gettysburg Battle App. We have a specific one just on Devil's Den and Little Round Top called the Day 2 App. So if you want to learn more, there's lots on our website, battlefields.org, and there's lots on um, the App Store as well, whether you're an Android user or a smartphone user. We're going to keep moving here as we go from the Devil's Bath right here. This is supposedly maybe where the snake see. He would go and kill and capture little kids around Gettysburg, unsuspecting little kids and whatnot. He would go up to the Devil's Kitchen, serve them up, bathe here afterward, and then hang out in the Devil's Den. I don't know. It's probably called Devil's den because of the rocky nature of the ground. Um, you look at devils anything around the country, it's all rocky areas. The Pennsylvania Dutch farmers around here used to call rocks the devil because they were supposedly put there by the devil to inhabit their fields and mess with the rock formations at this point. Anything to add here, Doug? No, is the answer, because who cares about this stuff? It's only Tim and I anyway here. Tim's walking toward the front of the Devil's Den. This is the most famous rock formation of the Devil's Den. It's known as the Table Rock. We've got all sorts of other good rocks named around here. The Wad Rock, the Table Rock, the Run Up Rock, because kids and some immature adults like to run up that rock without using their hands as well. We've got all sorts of other stuff going on around here. So for the Table Rock, in a nutshell, um, uh, I know Chris is dying to do the Austin Powers line at that point. Um, this is this big rock. Now that massive rock, and I've seen estimations between 200 and 800, 600 tons for that rock. There's one point of that rock sloping down where it sits pointing, touching another rock, and that point is about this big. Okay, it's about the size of my hand. The Park Service became concerned about this um, over the years, and they hired an engineering firm in the 70s and made hash marks on it to see if the rock is moving. They determined absolutely the table rock will fall. Um, you know, and you could imagine what that's going to look like. Uh, hopefully nobody's under it when it comes down. I'm happy to say in about 40 years, the uh, hash marks have not moved. That rock has not shifted in the last 40 years. Now, we were talking earlier on the last live, and by the way, look at the live we did this morning of Hood's Charge. Um, look at the uh, live that uh, we did last year at Gettysburg 154. Go to on your desktop, you can find an easy playlist under videos on the American Battlefield Trust Facebook page. On your on your mobile device, it's a little harder to find, but bear with us. We did Devil's Den last year as well. We did Little Round Top last year as well, so you can fill in anything we don't talk about here. But with all the tourism going around here, and in the 1890s, you didn't take a camera with you, you went to the camera, and the camera was here. Tim, what are the local people do because they knew a camera would be here. Uh, uh, you know, it's fascinating, Devil's Den, and the commercialism that surrounded it. It's really hard to fathom today. But Devil's Den became very popular because of the weird, eerie appearance of the rocks. Besides the fact that there was heavy fighting here, and because there were so many rocks and it was hard to bury bodies, bodies were continually eroding out of the ground, and people were finding bones from the soldiers that were involved in the fighting years after the battle. So cameramen, uh, William Tipton specifically, and the Mumper family set up a photographic studio over here. Remember we mentioned by 1893 there was an electric railway, and by 1894 this place was very crowded and cameramen arrived here they set up their photographs photographers equipment in front of the rocks and were taking photographs of people in front of the table rock and because of that local people began to carve their name on the rocks of devil's dad okay and i think i can find a picture of that as i go along um, in, in it because they knew um give me a sec connor i'm going to show you a better picture here anyway they knew that if they put their name on the table rock first let me show it to chris and i'll show it to connor here that their name would appear in thousands if not tens of thousands of photos now you look at that rock now and on the 
the right day, you might be able to see the H and the CH here. You can't see the Maurice Fox. And if you can tell, the shun is actually cooperating. You can see that there are big splotches there because in the 1890s, specifically 1894, the US government came in and carefully removed them. And that meant taking chisels and chiseling into the rocks. And for a good 15 years, the rocks looked splotched where they'd removed the graffiti. They did that because they figured, you know, it's not like these were soldiers putting their initials in there. This was local graffiti. And they figured if they didn't scratch them out then, that everybody would continue to do it. And they were probably right. Um, happily for us, there are still a few left that the government missed or that came after the government chiselers were here, actually. And you can still see some of those. And some of those are connected with the locals, such as John Houck's 1867 carving. That one escaped the chiselers. He owned Devil's Den. I think his should have been allowed to stay. Tim? Yes. OK, good. Let's keep moving here. Uh, anybody else jump in as you go? We're actually going to make this a short live. We're not going to go too much farther. But let's pen off to the right real quick as we walk. We're not going to go over there, but that's where the photographic operations were taking place. That's where Tipton had his park. That's where the trolley would stop. Right above that, across that bridge over there, you had spring water. You had two places to eat. You could get drink, j drinks made of gin. You could get your photo taken, um, a small tin type there. You could come over here and get it. This was a very commercialized place um, in the 1890s. And there was a big fight in the late 1890s as to whether this would become a giant tourist attraction or a historic shrine. And this eventually went to the US Supreme Court as the US government condemned the trolley successfully. And that set the case law. Yes, the government can condemn land for purposes of a historical park. So also not bad that we're down here because now we start to see some of these other Union monuments that come down here, these Union regiments. Imagine if you're a member of the 4th Maine. You started the day and you were up on top of Devil's Den and you're going to get orders to come down in this valley. If you're the commander of the 4th Maine, you know this is a bad deal. And yet nonetheless, in order to go ahead and stave off the defense of the Union line, they're going to come down the backside of this and now they're going to be down in this valley. They're going to accept a worse position because that's what the rest of the Army needs for them to do. And we'd find other units that get sent down here. You'd have the 140th New York or the 40th New York down in the middle of this valley that would come from the wheat field to be sent down in here. Imagine coming from another good position and being sent down into this valley of death sitting between these rocks and this crag of boulders known as Devil's Den and the high ground that's Little Round Top. All right, that's great. Two more things before we uh, wrap up here at Devil's Den. And man, could we spend eight hours here? I'd love to give an eight hour tour of Devil's Den again. I haven't done it in a long time. But the fourth main monument, just real quick, they put this up in the early 1890s. Uh, the Colonel designed it, but they left the Colonel's name off the monument. Uh, water was gathering into the base of it. They got the casualty figures wrong. They put the flank markers in the wrong position so that they were facing in the wrong direction. And the red diamonds of the 3rd Corps 1st Division weren't, weren't put on right and they were falling off. So in about 1895, they moved the flank markers so that it would be in the right position and the regiment would be facing the right way. They took the uh, red diamonds and put them on with cement instead of gypsum. They put the colonel's name on it, fixed the casualty figures. And in the most useless thing we'll tell you during this anniversary, or might be second most, they dug this little trench right here, which has been allowing water to drain out of this hole and has been staining the rock ever since. What does that teach us about the Battle of Gettysburg? Nothing but understanding the battlefield after the Civil War, when post-war features dotted the landscape, this is the battlefield the veterans knew. They knew this battlefield, the 1890s battlefield, better than they knew um, the uh, uh, 1863 battlefield. This is the one they remember. They weren't being shot at. Let's take a few steps here and conclude over here because we said why Devil's Den got its name. We're really not sure about it, but a lot of it's associated with animals and whatnot. And Tim at a distance actually spotted something over there. He's going to go get it. He's going to trudge on through there. No matter the ticks, no matter what's in there, he's going to go Go over to that rock and pull something out. This is not staged. Um, this was already there. I can see it from here. Oh, um, let's check it out. Let's hope he's not still here. Yeah. Okay, be careful so it doesn't fall apart. Let's see how. Oh, it's not a tiny one. Oh, yeah. So look at this. The Devil's Den is aptly named. What is this? Hold on. Hold it closer to the camera so we can say, look, it's 26 feet long. There you go. To, um, you're gonna want yeah. to... <laughs> and here it is. So the snakes often hang out in the rocks of Devil's Den. The largest one I've seen in this area was about 11 feet long. Of course, an 11 foot long black snake. And that's the most common. The northern black racer is still only about this thick. It's not like it was going to swallow me. But I did beat a hasty retreat, even though it's not poisonous. There are copperheads here, but they're very rarely seen um, in this area. But they love this rock. And this is not the first time we found a snake skin here. And with this, I don't think we can top it, Tim. No. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks for your comments. Um, thanks for engaging with us on Facebook. And of course, thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation.